Our scripture today, Matthew 7, 1 to 6. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye, you hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will clearly see to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Thank you, Bunny. And as you can tell, we are going through the Sermon on the Mount together. And last week, we heard a wonderful sermon from Pastor Bonnie, where she spoke about a, a climactic moment in the Sermon on the Mount, where we're invited as disciples and followers of Jesus to not worry. And then, on Tuesday, I had the duty with my wife of taking my four-year-old son and dropping him off at kindergarten. And so I'm so glad that God is giving me no opportunities to put the preached word into practice. No, actually, we were completely terrified <laughs> um, from the experience and uh, just this idea that we want to control the situations of our life. And really, we worry about the future and what it holds for us because we want to love and protect and care and make sure things are in order. And that desire comes from a good place. But if we put ourselves in the driver's seat, all kinds of of strange, stinking thinking can take place. And anxiety can take over. And so in our uh, text today, we're going to be in a similar framework and theme, which is this idea of how the human temptation is to take control. But now we're going to move from our desire to control the future to our desire to control the people around us. And Jesus speaks to two main themes, two main temptations that we all struggle with when it comes to wanting to control the people around us. We like to use judgment, and we like then, if judgment may, maybe doesn't work, we can go to bribery, can't we? Um, so there's many ways in which God wants to ultimately speak to us about that moment uh, that I had this week where, you know, as a parent, your heart leaves your body, puts a little Spider-Man backpack on, and you're invited by the teacher eventually to allow that little four-year-old to just go off on their own with the rest of, rest of the classroom and Remy was the first to fall into tears. And I just gripped the back of my arm like this, um, trying to hold it all together and be the strong one, even though I wanted to fall apart right next to him in that moment. But to go from there and to wrestle, but to pray that prayer, God, I can't be a kindergarten but you can, and you are in charge. This little boy is yours, not mine. And so I need you to be there. I surrender my desire to control into your hands. And I know many of you also have kiddos that are getting ready to go to school. And so my prayer is that we can live into that promise of God that if we seek his kingdom first and we pursue 
the things of God, that he knows that we have these needs for food and for clothing, and um, look how he clothes uh, the lilies of the field. And as one friend of mine from the sack lunch program that we heard about today told me right after my devotional, uh, a little phrase that he heard on the radio from a preacher out in Joshua Tree who said, if God can light the butt of a bug, think what he can do for you. (laughs) And so I am here today to wrestle with trust and to walk by faith and not by sight. And I encourage you as you hear these words, as Jesus speaks them, do not judge that this is a command from God who came to earth, who took on flesh and blood, and took time to teach human beings the most essential truths that they need to know in order to live their best life. And so he says, do not judge. And he's not speaking about, you know, the judge in the courtroom necessarily. We see those scenes many times. There's a whole book in the Bible called Judges where discernment is a big theme. Or maybe even that type of judgment where we have to make a decision between two difficult choices. But more the essence of the usage in this context of judgment as judging somebody else to lower them so that you might be raised up. And I wonder if Jesus in his providence might have thought of us who have devices in our pockets that if we click on certain apps that we spend many, many hours on that invite us to like or not like whatever comes in our endless scroll and also invite us to make an image and caricature of ourselves and represent ourselves um, to the public in a certain way. And he thought about us in 2019 when he said, do not judge. Because we see the consequences of this endless human phenomena of reducing others, labeling others. Our minds are like labeling machines, and we like to put people in categories and stick them there and leave them there for as long as we can because it orders our world and tells us where our place in our world is and what our status is in life. But he says, do not judge. But then he says, when you do, or that's the Peter translation, but I think it's there, right? He says, do not judge, but I know you're going to. So when you do... May you know that the degree to which you judge will also be given to you in return. And we all know this, right? In just practical terms, if you spend a lot of time with somebody who likes to label and talk about other people and you start developing that relationship with that person, all of a sudden, a few weeks later, that person's with somebody else. And guess what they're doing with that person talking about you. And guess what you're doing with that other person talking about them. And the person and the people who are the most inclined to label are the most inclined to receive that labeling, right? We had a completely different moment, the inverse of this boomerang effect this week. Obviously, I told you, My son went to kindergarten, so Tuesday morning was like high anxiety at the Dunn household. But my mom wanted to make it special for, I mean mom, not my mom, Katie, wanted to make it special for our son. And so 
7.30 in the morning or so, she throws him in the car and goes to get donuts. As she's pulling out, we live next to a middle school. Well, it was really hard to see in the back. My wife, she told me I could tell the story, accidentally hits the gas instead of the brake and comes flying out of our driveway and there's somebody just happens to be driving by right at that moment. So I'm standing in the kitchen. I can see from the window down to the driveway, the kaboom. And I'm like, oh, we didn't need this. <laughs> and I see a big guy get out of his car, walk up to the window. So I'm, all of a sudden I'm in protection mode. I walk out of my house go to the driveway, Katie's in fear, Remy's in fear, Some, he's, this guy's talking to Katie, trying to explain what happened, and he was just driving by and tried to get out of the way and all these things, and I'm very silent because my dad told me, never admit anything, you know, <laughs> he's a lawyer. But it was like a really intense moment, and you know, there's cars everywhere, and uh, a lot of anxiety, but eventually, the guy just turns to me. He turns to his car, points out all the other places where he had little dents and stuff. And he said, you know what? I can't even tell which dent is from you guys. And he just gets back in his car, and he drives away. And I'm like, all right. Amazing. So about a half hour later, we show up at... Uh, Remy's new elementary school, and guess who's there opening the door for us? But this guy who we just had the accident with. And I was like, who is this saint? (laughs) And I thought I was going to have to amend this story yesterday because he showed up again at our doorstep. It was like, Katie was like, that's why you can't get in an accident in front of your house, because they know where you live. (laughs) But he showed up again, having a little bit of a second thought, and, you know, his door wasn't opening, and all these kinds of things. So we had this whole conversation with him, and we go back and forth, and I say, hey, you know, our kids go to elementary school together, and we try and look as cute and nice as possible, and... We say, of course, we'd be willing to help, and we, you know, admit that that it was our fault and all this stuff. So that night, he says, you know what? Just pay it forward. No problem. And we were like, wow, this is a kind, kind person that they would just say at the end of the day, I got enough bumps on my car that I'm going to forgive you guys, and let's just live in a life of generosity to pay it forward. Lord, judge him kindly, because the boomerang effect is real, I believe. That ultimately, what you put out there in just practical terms, will you will receive from your peers and the people around you. And judgment, at the end of the day, is about wanting to control the people in your life. We can all think of parents that want to label their kids as smart and wonderful and the best of the best and ignore the times where they're maybe falling short or prideful or judgmental because we believe our judgments are correct about them at all times and so maybe we turn a blind eye. Or maybe the inverse is when somebody in your family wants to get better and go for a dream and improve themselves and change out of those bad habits that they learned in their family and core units and they want to excel and then the people around them and the family system starts getting out of whack and they start going, well, but we know about you. We grew up with you. We've seen what you're really like and how you really belong with us down here in this dysfunctional system. But God through Jesus, is bringing a message that says, may my disciples never look upon each other in order to lower one another and to gain status 
and to gain privilege by reducing my beautiful, wonderful creation into singular labels and stereotypes and cartoons. And that's why he turns then to speaking about how we see. Really a callback to earlier in the sermon in chapter 5, where Jesus says that the eye is the lamp of the body. And that if you receive light through your eyes, then you will radiate light. And if your perspective is diminished, then how great is that darkness that is within you? And in this postmodern world we live in, perspective is all the rage, right? Each person has their individual vantage point and perspective. And we all know that whatever happens, even through this sermon, you'll all go back and filter it through your lens or whatever experience we have, and you will have your experiences imported onto what was said, and that will shape the way that you understand and receive a message. And so Jesus is saying that if you want to see clearly that the work that you must do is first a work of self-reflection, to notice that you have a massive block in your own eye that prevents you from seeing the way that God sees. And you must first look into your own soul and examine all of those places that you do not want to look at and let Jesus, by his love, take that log out of your eye and give you his way of seeing. And that is the beginning of the way in which you can even think about getting out a little bit of sawdust. You know, delicately removing carefully just that tiny speck from the people around you got a couple quotes that I want to read to you that I really enjoyed this week when sermon planning. And I really believe this one hits me um, and, and a temptation that I fall into. Jesus here is confronting all of us with the problem of hypocrisy. We all want to see justice done just not when it catches up with us you see it's so easy to look at the world and all the injustices of the world and to to rail against all the things that are happening that are really not that much in our control and if we live in the place of the external judgment it can become a huge barrier to the justice that we know we deserve. Or let's just speak to the preacher so you know that I'm with you. I love this quote from G.K. Chesterton. He says, It is easier to declaim like an orator, orator against a thousand sins of others than it is to mortify, meaning to ask for forgiveness for one sin like Christians in ourselves to be more industrious in our pulpits than in our closets, to preach 20 sermons to our people than one to our own hearts. How are your eyes? How do you look upon the people that you encounter in your house, in your daily life, as you look at the news, how do you see these people? It's pretty clear. Do not judge. How are we 
seeing the way God sees the people around us. Another way to think about this is to talk about color. Because I was sitting there with my son watching a cartoon, and it was explaining waves of light and how we see the color in this room even, and how crazy it is they use the example of a banana, that really when you see the yellow of a banana, that it's just waves of light bouncing off of that banana, coming to cones in your eyes, and then somehow filtered through a prism that then reveals light to each person in a room. And just what an incredible idea that that is alone. Like, you could explain it over and over, but it is like, just that alone is like a beautiful orchestra playing every second in your eyes and how you perceive things and light. And then I was listening to a a great teacher at Fuller Seminary, uh, Professor Fukujimura, And he works in the art department, and he was speaking about our political system and a lot of the brokenness within our political system and how in America we have two fundamental principles that guide our two parties. One is independence, and the other is dependence. And he likened that to a color wheel. And he said that, you know, on, in the color wheel of a painter, that there is basically complementary colors, right? We all learn that in basic science, Roy G. Biv or whatever it is. And there's colors that if you mix them together will make another color, those primary colors to secondary colors. But then there's other colors that when you put them together, they just make like a, a dark mud. Remy's, uh, most of his paintings look like this. You know, because he just likes to get the paint out and just put it all together. But what Fukujimura was saying is that in his culture, that they have a culture of interdependence. And that the great painters, like Matisse, were able to take these colors that if you put them to make together make that ugly brown color, but if you put them interdependently, meaning side by side, in a complementary style, that they actually elevate the color. And so I have a couple of Matisse paintings just to give you a feeling of what that would be like. Um, and, and, And the conversation was around, what if our leaders in whatever sphere, political or other, were really great at seeing how people can complement one another and how we can bring out the radiance of God's color scheme that God can see in so many more contrasts and variations and so much more beauty than we can see. And his color scheme is beyond our imaginations. And so really, when we judge, what we're doing is saying, God, let me decide which color each person gets. But we just can't see how it all fits the way that God does. And so I I believe Scripture's witness is to say, will you let God be the judge? that there will be judgment, that there will be discerning and wisdom. But he sees so much more about every person, so much more those details about every person than we can see. And so we can walk more lighthearted and open-handed with the people we engage with, knowing we don't know everything about their stories. And then the the final turn in the story is kind of a fun one, too. Really, sacred wisdom, but comes to us in a strange metaphor, right? Do not throw your pearls before swine. 
meaning every person here has some pearls. Um, Every person here has some gifts and goodness within them. And one other way to try and control folk around you is to endlessly give them the things that you believe are good, and they may even be really good, and they may even be the thing that somebody really does need in order to get better. But if they are not in a position yet ready to receive the good gifts and to go the way that you want them to go, that can also become a pretty treacherous path to walk in relationship. I remember my wife coming home from her first internship as a therapist and talking about the core mandated therapy that she would have to do and how difficult it was to give therapy to people that didn't want therapy. And I think this is what Jesus' wisdom here is, as Carl Rogers talks about, the necessary preconditions for the therapeutic process. One is that the person coming to therapy has a desire to get better. And we will come across people in our lives and relationships in our lives where we can endlessly pour ourselves out to them, hoping that they will get better. But if they don't want that, they could take what you're giving in sincerity, maybe with a little string attached, and turn around and bite you and resent you even for the good things that you are giving them. And so we must surrender in whatever form it takes. And one way that I've been trying to do that in my prayer life uh, recently is to sit in my little corner of my office and just imagine in that corner office that I'm in like a little house. Um, And that house is filling up with the grace of God. With this reality that the beloved nature of God is taking over the space. And I want you for a moment to just imagine that with me, like in this sanctuary right now, that the beloved nature of God is filling up this room. And as it's filling up, we have to reflect on what can stay and what can't stay. And faced with this incredible, passionate, caring love, Things cannot stay. Addictions can't stay. Anxiety cannot stay. The desire to control the people in our lives cannot stay. Because there's only room for the love of God. And he's filling of this space and revealing to us that his way, his goodness is all that really matters and all the beautiful colors that there are to see come down to how well we can make space for this love to enter into our lives. Will you pray with me? Lord, I come to you and ask for your care over this congregation, God. I ask that you would sanctify us through the renewing of your Holy Spirit to become kinder, more loving, more generous to the people around us. Lord, we thank you that you have forgiven us 
a great debt. And may that always be at the forefront of our minds as we interact with the people that we come across in our day. Knowing that somehow you're taking care of it all. And so we pray, Lord, a prayer of gratitude and thankfulness that you've brought us this far. And we pray a cry from our hearts, Lord, your kingdom come. May it look at St. Andrew's like it does in heaven. And may we heed your word, Lord, that we might not judge or cast our pearls before swine, but always look to you and your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen.